Last week, Conflict Zone put the spotlight on Britain's fast approaching EU referendum and we talked to the Leave campaign. This week, it's the turn of those who want to remain in the EU and one of their leading supporters, the Labour MP Stephen Kinnock. Why does he believe that leaving the EU would be a betrayal of British values? Stephen Kinnock, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. A nervous time for you coming up to the uh, referendum. So nervous that you've even started to talk about what it would be like to lose, haven't you? <laughs> well, what I was actually trying to do was say that the Leave campaign has made no attempt at all to describe what a post-Brexit UK would look like. So the question I was raising was, if we were to vote to leave, which I clearly hope that we won't, what would the mandate be? Because there's a huge difference between staying in the single market or leaving it. But why but raise it now? Because not... you sense defeat, don't you? No, I'm raising it now because I think it's really important that when people go to the ballot box on the 23rd of June, they understand what leave means. And at the moment, they, there's a black hole where but the they answer know what to they, that question should if, be. If they vote leave, they know what they don't want. They don't want free movement. They don't want to massive contributions to the EU. And they don't want to be governed by laws made in Brussels, do they? Precisely. That'll be, that'll be quite clear what they don't want. Precisely the point that if you... And you want to water that down? It, no, I, what I'm saying is if the op option on the table is to stay in the single market, like Norway is, not in the EU, but in the single market, you have to accept free movement of people and you have to pay into the EU but budget. But they don't want that. Is that it's what they want? It's quite clear that the Leave campaign doesn't oh, want Oh, is it? That, isn't it? Oh, well, I, the last I looked, they had 23 different models that they've proposed. They have, they have not, in my, in my view, they've deliberately not defined uh, what model they but want to go But you raise the prospect of watering down the will of the British people, and that's a serious thing to do, isn't it? The question I'm asking is, when people vote leave on the 23rd of June, what are they actually voting for, in or out of the single market? And as we don't have an answer to that question, if we do vote leave, where does that leave Parliament after the 23rd? Because the debate will be, what sort of deal do we do with the EU, with the remaining 27 member states? But there won't be a clear mandate. If the, e if the Leave campaign had said from the beginning, right, we want to stay in the single market, but we want out of the EU, OK, that would be clear. Or there was, if they'd said from the beginning, right, we want out, we want the Canada model. But why raise this but now? Why raise this now? Because, because it suggests that you want to tamper with the result if it doesn't go the way you want. You're leaving that possibility. You will try to dilute the will of the people. Not at all. The reason I'm raising it is to draw attention. Because you're worried. No, to draw attention to the fact that the Leave campaign is actually presenting a non-choice to the British people because it's, it's Leave. But underneath leave, there are so many different questions, and none of those have been answered. If we leave the single market... But nobody said it was market, going to be a simple process. Well... But, but the vote, the vote is, is going to be quite clear one way or the other, isn't it? We have the biggest choice that's faced this country for generations on the 23rd of June, and people are going into those ballot boxes without any clarity at all on what leave looks like. And I think that that is a major question for our democracy. It's a, it's a hard sell, the EU, isn't it, these days? Uh, a, a European Union that's waning in influence, meddles far too much in the affairs of the constituent members, a union that fails to respect individual governments. That's a hard sell, isn't it? I've been... Or is that too bleak an assessment for you? I've been a member of parliament for a year now, and we've voted on dozens of things. Uh, you know, the budget, welfare, um, shop opening hours, the trade union bill. Absolutely none of that is coming from Brussels. But between uh, 15 and 50 percent of British laws, according to the House of Commons Library in 2010, owe their origin to Brussels. I don't see that. I mean, you may where, see what, it, our but budget. But those are the figures from your House of Commons Library. So for over the last year, budget, welfare, trade union bill, all these bills that have come through, it's our budget. This is a sovereign parliament dealing with government legislation that's come from a sovereign British government. Yes, there is some legislation that comes from Brussels Between in order to facilitate... Between 15 and 50 percent. That may well be what's written on in the House of Commons library, but my... I'm that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good estimate, I'm, What it? I'm sharing with you is my experience of the last year, that that's simply... And that there's a big debate about, OK, well, what's the Well, you don't rub up against Brussels because you, you approve of the EU. 
I don't rub up against Brussels because I'm a British MP voting on in a sovereign British Parliament. And Wales is getting plenty British of and Wales is where you have your constituency is getting plenty of money out of the EU, but there are other parts of the UK that aren't. Well, the regional development funds exist in order to create a balanced and cohesive model across the whole of the European Union. And as we know, Wales is uh, one of the most economically challenged regions of the UK. That's why I support the regional development funding, because it actually helps to, you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And a the union, idea behind the, the regional development funding is to balance that up. A union that fails to respect individual governments, whose institutions no longer command respect in member states, where the majority of Europeans no longer feel their voices heard, and you want to shackle Britain to that indefinitely. I actually feel, I mean, I've been... And those are criticisms that come from the President of the European Commission. I've and been this is Jean-Claude Juncker yeah. who says that about his own organisation. He might as well be working for, for the Leaf campaign, mightn't he? <laughs> I have been working in and around the EU institutions for many, many years and following it with great interest. I did my Masters in European Studies at the College of Europe. I have never seen such a nationally driven EU as what we have now. In fact, the member states are playing a much more uh, influential role in taking the EU forward but they're losing I've economic clout. The, the Commission is they? taking a back seat. They're That's maybe why Mr. Juncker was, isn't happy. That's what he says. We are losing economic clout in a very visible way with the low birth rate. We're no longer respected in our countries when we emphasize the need to give priority to the EU. One of the reasons that European citizens are stepping away from the European project is that we're interfering in too many domains of their private lives. Hardly a ringing endorsement of his own European Union, is it? Look, the, nobody is saying that the EU is perfect. This is course, a long way from perfect. Uh, well, this, is, this is unreformable, isn't I, it? I think you could probably apply that critique to a lot of national governments. But it's unreformable. I, I would certainly apply it to our British government now, which I think is doing an appallingly bad job of running the country. The democracies all over the world are facing major challenges. But my question you're, is... You're on the same what, side as this girl. You're campaigning on the same side, and yet... And yet you're so divided, the campaigns are so divided. How do you expect to unify the country if you can't even unify your campaigns? Actually, the Remain campaign, I feel, is very, very united. It's been, I've shared a platform, for example, at a rally on Saturday with Paddy Ashdown and, and also with a member of uh, Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Party. And it was, there was a really great sense that we're in this together. And whilst we have our differences politically, we are united in the view that Britain is stronger in Europe. But you're not even united with the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, are you? I mean, you've criticised him. You, you actually contributed uh, nothing to party unity by stabbing Corbyn in the front and publicly questioning his ability to lead the party, didn't you? When did I do that? You, you said this in March in the Huffington Post. You said the big question is when people look at him, do they see somebody who could be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? Hardly a ringing endorsement. At the same time as you've been touting Angela Eagle, a member of the Shadow Cabinet, calling her a great leader. Look, I, by, I, by questioning his credentials in public, you're stabbing him in the front, aren't you? I think that the question that I asked is a question that should be asked of any leader. Uh, you know, is it a, it's, a, it's a question we should be asking, for example, about any of the potential candidates for leadership of the Conservative but Party. But you weren't asking that question about party. Angela Eagle, were you? Come on. I mean, be, be straight here. You can't stand the man and you don't think he's going to be a leader. Look, Jeremy is the leader of our party. He you don't think he can win an election, mandate. do you? Leaders are judged by their results. And the um, results haven't been good. You set standards for him and he didn't meet them. You wanted gains in England. You lost 18 seats in England. You wanted to come at least second in Scotland. You actually came third behind the Conservatives, which, given their record in Scotland, is quite a feat, isn't it? With the Labour quite a disaster for you. The Labour Party is facing major challenges. We've got to uh, get our story right. We've got to connect with the British people again in a way that's really relevant yeah, to their Jeremy lives. But Jeremy Corbyn isn't connecting, is he? We, with results like that, he's not connecting. We've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go, and it's a steep hill to climb. And I'm he's the not the right to person to take that. you there. Well, as I say, leaders are judged by their results. It's early days. I, yet, I notice you're it. not giving him an endorsement here. I'm giving you plenty of opportunity to give him one, but you're declining that I've been elected, offer. I've been elected to represent the people in my constituency who are facing major challenges, and many of those challenges are caused by this appallingly bad Conservative government. So I will hold any leader of the Labour Party to the benchmark that we need to be delivering and we need to be winning. And I'm, I'm not going to... And by criticising him in public? 
You criticized him for not doing enough to, to back the Remain camp. You even said, perhaps rather insultingly to him, that he should roll up his sleeves like the Prime Minister. Uh, I, he, he would have enjoyed that. Uh, look, I think... Clearly, he would have enjoyed that. I, I think that we should be treating this uh, campaign for this referendum as the most important campaign in a generation. And in my view, we should be out there every single day in factories, in uh, businesses, in schools, in hospitals, on trains, wherever it, you need to be, making the case. So he hasn't done must a stay proper job inside on this. the EU. You're disappointed. The EU trade unions are I'll, disappointed. I'll, I'll with be, it. I would have liked to see uh, Jeremy out you're there. You're more disappointed on the stump. with it. I, I would have liked to see him out there on the stump. That's more disappointment, than he isn't has it? Been. You're I, disappointed. Look, I mean, I, I'm not going to get emotional about it. It's I'm not emotional. It's well, just, well, are you dis pleased uh, or disappointed? You're I, disappointed. I, I would you? have liked to see him out on the stump every day as if this were a short campaign in a general election. And <laughs> there's still time. We can still do that. We can still absolutely make it clear to the British people that we are 100%, 90% of the parliamentary Labour Party, 90% of Labour MPs are fully signed up to the Remain campaign. We're far more united than any other party on this. And it is worrying if people out there don't and see it's, that it's, and understand that. And it's that. worrying and if the leader, in your view, doesn't play his part. Um, there's there have been accusations of a lot of hype by both campaigns. You've been part of this hype, haven't you, in a way? In April, you wrote Brexit would be a betrayal of the moral, political and economic principles that have underpinned Britain's post-war journey. Yes. Let me get this straight. Reasserting the primacy of the British Parliament in British affairs is a betrayal of moral and political principles? The point I was making in that article is we've been on a journey since the Second World War where we've integrated with Europe whilst keeping the balance right with the Commonwealth and the United States. I understand, States. but this is, you're talking is about a, a betrayal. Journey. You're talking about a betrayal of British values if people vote to leave, if people vote, want to increase their sovereignty, get uh, back the right to make their own laws, British laws for British people? Well, let's uh, look at that word sovereignty. In my view, leaving the EU would fundamentally weaken our sovereignty. This is a dangerous and uncertain world. You pull up the drawbridge and float off into the mid-Atlantic, your sovereignty is deeply weakened by that move. That's why it would be a betrayal. I am pro EU. Asserting the primacy I'm... of British courts is, is, is a betrayal. Well, the primacy of British courts is not in question. The, the European well, it is Court because of they can be overruled by the European Court in, of Justice, in certain, can't they? In certain areas of EU legislation, if you're going to make this system work, if you're going to make a European system work, you need European institutions. You need the And European law is the law the of first instance in this country. It's Look, the law of first instance. And, and people want to change it. We've been in the EU for 43 years, and it's done us pretty well. We've seen growth. We've seen stability. We've seen security. We've seen peace. You, in order to get, you need to give a little bit to get something back. I see sovereignty like a boomerang. You throw it out there. You pull a little bit and more comes back to you, and you end up actually being stronger through the partnerships, through the pooling of sovereignty. Yes, that means compromise. Sometimes that means negotiation. But we, we're, we're, we're adults. We should be living in an adult world and working with this in a way which is ensuring that we make a patriotic case for the EU. What I and what about stopping contributions to a wasteful bureaucracy that consistently fails to clean up the perennial fraud and mismanagement of its finances? What about that? Well, look, 55,000 civil servants in the EU, 60,000 civil servants in the city of Birmingham. So the idea that we've got some kind of huge bureaucracy in Brussels, it's absolutely Yeah, but 60,000 60, bureaucrats in, 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 where did you say? Birmingham. In Birmingham. City of Birmingham. Then they're not wasting 6.3 billion, uh, billion euros in a year, which is what the Court of Auditors said last November that the Commission had done, cited 6.3 billion euros that had been misspent 2014-2015. Birmingham bureaucrats aren't doing that. The, uh, but the EU bureaucrats are. The, that, that's huge wastage, isn't it? That's unacceptable. The challenges with the accounting are around uh, administrative errors in member states. The, members, the, the budgets are devolved to the member states. The way that they're dispersed and implemented is where there are challenges. And there are some member states that have not done as well as they should be in spending EU money. But it's not money that's being spent by the Commission. It's money, once they've divided up the EU funds, it goes to the member states 
and in some cases they're not doing the job that they should be doing. But there were 28 Well, they have their own dispersed. fraud investigators, and they have had for decades. And we keep on getting these results to the point where the court's president, Vitor Caldera, said last November, we cannot afford to do business as usual. This is business as usual. Wastage of an order of 6.3 billion euros in a single year. My point on this is that the member states have got to get their house in order. And what we need to do is move away from this constant narrative of scapegoating uh, and denigrating the EU. But this comes when, from their auditing watchdog. Sure. This but, isn't yeah. denigrating. This is fact. 6.3 yeah. billion euros. But it, but you, you don't seem to regard this as very important. Th I do. Very, very important. Any penny of taxpayers' money is very important. But this is about the member states. And Jean-Claude Juncker says spending. he's doing his best to save money. Save money by wasting 6.3 billion, at least. Look, I mean, we have an EU budget, and as we've discussed in Wales, that EU budget, I think, is spent very well on some very important infrastructure and economic development projects. But in other countries, when it gets to that country, it isn't always dealt with in the right way. And the, EU's, the, audit, the EU auditor's job is to play the central coordinating role on the checking and on the auditing. But the challenge with the money and the disbursement of the money is at the member state level. Well, whoever's responsibility is, they're doing a lousy job, aren't they? In some of the and member states, it is definitely not. And, where and it the be. EU's profligate enlargement programs are costing an enormous amount of money that's disappearing down a black hole. You take uh, the Balkans investment, for instance, take the investment in Albania, pouring money into a country whose own prime minister says that it is the most corrupt justice system in the world. 2014, 2020, 649 million euros of EU money, part of which contributed by Britain. Why should they pour money into this black hole, which is characterized by trafficking in people, fraud on a grand scale, trafficking arms, trafficking drugs, and some of the most violent organized crime in, in Europe today? Why? I, Why pour money into this wastage? Well, I mean, what we know is with the former Soviet countries in the Eastern Bloc is that they've come from a deeply problematic past. And one of the great tributes to the European Union is because of its soft power, because of its power of attraction, it has helped those countries to change, to harmonize, to move to democracy, rule of law, but they're not the transition moving. to a market economy. They're not moving. They're Albania they're shows no sign of movement. In 2011, Europol said Albanian language gangs pose one of the biggest problems. They are notorious for their use of extreme violence. And do you know how Brussels rewarded them for that? They canceled the need to give them visas to get into Europe. So open the door up to massive organized crime walking straight through the door into the rest of Europe. How does that contribute to our security? I mean, uh, Albania is coming from a place where it was a basket uh, case, you know, under people like Enver Hoxha, and the, what, a, what an appalling, uh, so why open chaotic the doors history to this that kind they of have violence. had. If you want to solve the problems that, that are on your doorstep, you've got two choices. You either think you can pull up the drawbridge and float off into the mid-Atlantic, or you can engage and try and solve those problems. And I think the history of enlargement is, look where we've come. I mean, you know, when I was a teenager, the idea that I could even ever travel to somewhere like Poland and the Czech Republic was off the cards. Then the, the wall came down, and the European Union played an absolutely critical role in building peace, stability, uh, and the transition to a market economy, democracy, and the rule of law. And Stephen of course, Kinnett, in all places the Albanian like, uh, gangs are in Europe. Engagement. They're trafficking European people. They're trafficking in guns. They're trafficking in drugs. And the European Union has made it much easier for them to do that by opening the doors, not even requiring visas. Look at Kosovo, for instance. I mean, Kosovo may be years away from membership of the EU. Houses the largest EU foreign mission bar none. It's become a hotbed for radical Islamists. As New York Times pointed out last month, extremist clerics and secretive associations funded by Saudis and others have transformed a once tolerant Muslim society into a font of extremism. And somehow the EU, with the largest mission that it has abroad, didn't seem to notice that. Brilliant, isn't it? Well, I mean, we... Brilliant. We, we, Absolutely brilliant home goal. And guess what the reward was earlier this month, month ago? Free visas. No visa travel anymore. There is a huge challenge with places like Kosovo and Albania. It's not just and, a yeah. huge challenge. Co that, that's lovely political speak. 
that this is a disaster being allowed to unfold in the middle of Europe and envelop all the other European countries. I mean, I, don't, I just don't accept that analysis of what's going on. There's, there's a problem there. That, you know, there are always going to be criminals and there are always going to be bad people it's running around worse. doing things. It's getting things worse. It's getting worse. Listen to the report. But the Justice and Home Affairs Corporation, the European Arrest Warrant, the cooperation that goes on between the Five Eyes and the intelligence services, the way in which the EU integrates our economies so that we've got a strong and stable trust based alliance. Those are the things that we need to have in place if we're going to do. And the other question for me is, how would the UK leaving the EU help any of this stuff? We know that whenever Europe sneezes, the UK gets a cold. Whether it's in the EU or not, surely our history must teach us that. And if we want to be influencing, shaping agendas, using our superb diplomatic service, exerting pressure, and I hope one day with a Labour Prime Minister in Brussels, doing that, then we've got to stay in. We've got to be at the table. Europe, according to Europol, is facing its biggest terror threat in more than a decade, and it doesn't have the means to do it. The mayor of Antwerp recently said, Bart de Wever, Brussels doesn't do anything about terrorism. This is the mayor of Antwerp. You have the EU's own counter-terrorism coordinator, Gilles de Kerkhove, warning of more attacks if Europe doesn't start sharing more information. They said they were going to share more information out of the sh after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. They said they were going to share more information after Brussels. They've been saying they'll set up a passenger record information system for years, but they haven't done it. Why not? That, and you think this makes us more secure? This is a huge danger to Britain, isn't it? What's very important to bear in mind is if you take the 7-7 attacks here or the Bataclan attacks in, in Paris, they were perpetrated by citizens of those countries. So f the first thing I'd say is it's not connected to free movement of people because uh, if you've got citizens of your own countries, that's a problem of integration, not of immigration. My other view is that I think if there are mad people out there who want to do bad things, they're going to do it, whether or not the Schengen uh, zone exists. But you've got but the EU zone counter-terrorism coordinator says the system isn't fit for purpose. Then we've got to fix it. I mean, uh, well, you, you you've only been trying fix to it. fix it for years. Well, but does that mean you give up? I mean, you, if, if there you are major challenges. You have to say that your security is more important, the security in Britain is more important than tying yourself to an organization that doesn't know how to manage it. I am absolutely convinced that whether or not we're in the EU, we will face these security challenges. And being in the EU makes them far easier to tackle because you've got the institutional framework in place where you can work with your partners, work across the five eyes, work across uh, police cooperation, get those, and it, it's you say a, that, a, but the improvement EU's is required. The counter-terrorism coordinator is saying it doesn't work. He's warning darkly. He says we'll have cyber security issues, we'll have people going in all directions, and the number will be such that working nationally or bilaterally with no one in the center to coordinate, I think we will miss something. No one in the center to coordinate, and you say this is a safe system, and you're glad we're aligned with it in Britain. But Britain is aligned. I, I'm saying that there's room for improvement, and clearly uh, the system needs to work better. What we have is a mismatch between uh, massive uh, improvements in communication between people, and it's easier to get from one place to another. You've got everything from budget airlines to the internet, have revolutionized the way that we work with each other, both in terms of business and leisure. Those systems, that, those new technologies have shot ahead of nation states and national governments and our systems are trying to catch up. And, and that mismatch between what's happening out there on the streets and what's happening in terms of our authorities and the way that they cope with it, both in terms of governments regulating uh, international business and in terms of security agencies dealing with some of these security threats, that gap needs to be closed. And it's a work in progress. And I'm not at all saying that it's perfect. But there is nothing that the UK leaving would improve that situation. Quite the opposite. But this, this centerpiece of their security, which is supposed to be the Schengen information system, there's no proper guidance about what should even put on it. There's no requirement. There's no, uh, nobody's forced to put any information on that. Do you know how many names are on the Schengen information system? I'm sure you're going to tell me. Just eight. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's the centerpiece of supposedly European security. Not very impressive, is it? One of the challenges that the EU has always faced is that uh, member states are 
the building blocks of the EU and they're holding on to uh, their sovereignty. I can understand why they're doing that. Why? But for too why in long, the era of terrorism? For, why should you understand why they're doing that? Good question. Good question. But it's about national political cultures. It's about histories. It's about this sense that Br European leaders constantly feel they've got to go to Brussels and win something. And often winning a short-term victory. I mean, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, has in many ways been one of the worst exponents of this. He's, he did things like pull his party out of the European uh, center and conservative group in the European Parliament, which I think dramatically d reduced the UK's influence. He did it for short-term gain within his own party, short-term political All right, but I wanted to We state. need leaders who have a strategic view of what it means to create well, European clearly, partnerships. Clearly, you don't seem to have them in Europe either. Stephen Kinnock, thanks very much for being on Conflict. Zone. Thank you very much. Thank you.